So next is Jonathan Spice, Spice. Spice. Yep. Spice from Shadron, mm -hmm. and he's going to talk a little bit about um, patch burn grazing in North Dakota. Yeah, hi, th 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 thank you all for, for coming out today. Uh, this is a kind of overview of some of the, 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 the work they did when I was doing my PhD at North Dakota State University in the southwest part of North Dakota. Uh, the other kind of authors on the talk are, are all my committee members uh, while I was at uh, NDSU. I also like to, I guess, a quick shout out to my field research technicians. I did all my uh, field work by myself in 2017. We were able to find some money for technicians in 2018. I don't know why that's auto going. Uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 to help me collect more data. Uh, so Kelsey Morton, Sam Smith, uh, Simone Jarvis, and Fran Bowman. Uh, so our main kind of challenges or why we were interested in patch burn grazing in North Dakota, one, it's just a different environment than where it's mostly done kind of in the rest of the Great Plains. Uh, they're kind of some of the main kind of issues for, especially in the southwest part of North Dakota, is we have a lot of introduced cool season grass uh, plant communities that were either introduced intentionally for forage things like intermediate wheatgrass or used for CRP plantings, so would be like alfalfa and yellow sweet clover. Right? And we also have this additional invasion of smooth roam and Kentucky bluegrass across most of North Dakota and elsewhere in the northern Great Plains. Uh, when I teach plant ID now, we get to those plants in class, I call them like the unofficial grasses of the northern Great Plains because they're just kind of ubiquitous and they t take over these, these rangelands uh, in this area. Uh, and kind of shade out some of our, our some of our uh, plants that were there traditionally. Uh, so these novel plant communities have like kind of major implications for livestock production and biodiversity conservation. And when I get to talk to, to ranchers in southwest North Dakota, one of their main things to talk about like they're not necessarily trying to get rid of those plants because they let them almost they increase their stocking rate. They're able to increase their livestock production side of it. That does come at the expense of biodiversity kind of conservation. We have a very homogeneous plant community uh, at left at landscape. So one of our kind of interest things like if we use patch burn grazing can we kind of increase structural heterogeneity uh, in, in these kind of l l l l l l l lower diversity grasslands that we have. Um, another kind of ma main challenge is our kind of prescribed fire is a very uncommon practice on private rangelands across North Dakota. Uh, when I looked at it in 2020, I don't think NRCS in North Dakota had spent any money on cost share for prescribed burning. It was pretty much all cross fencing. Uh, one of the other uh, grad students in, in the lab I was at NDSU, she's finishing up her master's right now looking at some of the more human dimensions side of that. Uh, I think she has one or two papers out uh, in submission. Uh, for, for looking at some of those human dimensions parts of fire in North Dakota. So I'll, I'll Autumn Clark is her name, you can keep a look out for those. Uh, this is kind of what a lot of our non patch burn grazing uh, grasslands in the area look like. They're dominated by smooth brome, Kentucky bluegrass, this one in particular. So it's a very homogenous plant community across your kind of only kind of uh, variation in structure comes on the buttes where the native plants still live. So like, uh, the northern mixed grass prairie in the area should have a lot of uh, some grammas, uh, some blue stems, some wheat, 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 wheat grasses. I bet the only time I find those is when I'm on top of a butte. Uh, everything else is kind of smothered by these like three or four introduced cool season grasses. Uh, so our kind of main research goals was like, cause when you talk to people like, oh, you can't do that in North Dakota. I was like, well, did you try? And they're like, no. Uh, and it's like, well, that's kind of our thing at the Kitchen Center was trying to get a baseline. If somebody wanted to try this, what would it look like? Uh, kind of a, a baseline, uh, the kind of standard, uh, where we did a four-patch four uh, pasture uh, burn cycle. Uh, and kind of over time, what would that look like? Uh, how does that compare to other parts of the Great Plains or elsewhere they've done patch burn grazing? Kind of as you move patch burn grazing around, there's always some parts of it that don't work as well as in other places. So when you try to get a baseline understanding of what does it look like, uh, I, I mostly looked at veg structure and community composition, kind of the forage quality part of it and grazer space use. And then uh, when we talked to the ranchers, they're more in the livestock weight gain side of it. Um, so I did, did some stuff with that. I did body condition score also for the cows. It's a little harder to do that for sheep when they're out on pastures. So I, I, I'm, I did that. I don't have that in the data today, but I can talk about that later. And then the other kind of big thing comes up is the kind of soil health. And like, oh, if you're going to burn it, you're going to you have tor, hit tor, terrible soil moisture. Uh, you're going to kill the, or the soil microbes and soil nutrients. So I was like, we got very interested in that. We measured a lot of that. And we have some cool stuff uh, to show from that here at the end. Uh, so where uh, Hedinger is, the southwest corner of the state. Oh, that is a weird color. Okay, it looks a little different on my screen. Uh, but uh, for, for Hedinger is the southwest corner of North Dakota. It's around the South Dakota, uh, North Dakota border. Uh, there's another project uh, that I'm not going to talk about too much today in Streeter, uh, but for Hedinger, it's about a 14 inches annual rainfall. So it's a very semi-arid area. Uh, n n northern mixed grass prairie is what it's supposed to be. Uh, with the intermediate wheatgrass, though, it sometimes get plants that are like a meter and a half to two meters tall in the unburned areas. So it's, it's not quite a short grass or a mixed grass. It's, it's sometimes it looks almost like a tall grass if you let it go for a while. Our main experimental setup at Hedinger is comparing a patch burn with sheep as the main grazing component versus patch burn with cow-calf pairs. So like the Hedinger Center is mostly a sheep uh, ranch. They have about 2,500 sheep 
uh, that they go around and do stuff with, and the, the, the cows that they have there are to help the range people uh, help us tie into uh, other people across the Great Plains for that. Uh, all the pastures were previously enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program in the 80s, so they were planted with the intermediate wheatgrass alfalfa mix initially, but then, then invaded by smooth Roman Kentucky bluegrass after that. So it looks like a lot of what the area around us looks like, so it's not, we have s s some of the native plants still there, they're just in very small amounts. Uh, so being the semi-arid part of the Great Plains, uh, we have, uh, you're going to expect a lot of variability in precipitation, and that was the case for our study. Uh, kind of the, this black line uh, here is the, the 25 year average over the 95% confidence interval. Uh, two of our study years, 2017 and 2020, were a drought. They were a little under half of the, the rainfall during the growing season. Uh, 2018 was the opposite. It was almost double our annual rainfall. Uh, and then we had one year of normal rainfall. So if you're managing for the average rainfall, it's like, and then this time it happened one out of the four years uh, that we were doing patch burn grazing. Uh, so that kind of, especially for the livestock production side of it, it's going to come back around for there. So the initial part of veg structure and community composition, why kind of our, the main pitch for patch burn grazing is kind of increase structural heterogeneity uh, in these grasslands uh, to better benefit uh, grass and wildlife. Uh, so we're kind of get a baseline, how does that look? So we measured a bit veg transects across uh, each patch of each pasture. Uh, how we did our burns, they were pretty much all in the dormant season uh, preceding the following summer grazing season. Uh, so that's what the little dates are. I'm gonna use the same map with different little dots for where we sampled them. So I'm not gonna spend too much time so we can get to the results. Um, but we measured a lot of vegetation structural characteristics. I'm mostly going to talk about uh, visual obstruction or vore reading for our main structure. And we measured the tallest living thing and tallest dead thing. Uh, if you're comparing recently burned to other areas, your tallest dead thing should be very lower than recently burned or sometimes a zero because you had a good fire and everything got nuked. Um, and then, for especially for this, the third one, li 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 litter depth is very important. Uh, if you have a lot of bluegrass invaded areas, bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass can make a very thick litter thatch layer. If you look at the ecological sites for North Dakota, a lot of them say like, oh, you should expect one to two centimeters if it's the native uh, plant community. I had a lot of sites where I was taking like 15 to 20 centimeters of bluegrass thatch. And so you're trying to, we're trying to punch a hole in that to allow some other plants to come back up in there. Uh, so over the four years, uh, we documented 86 total species on, on these rangelands. Uh, however, most of it, or those introduced cool season grasses I talked about, intermediate wheatgrass, uh, it's the THIN, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome, alfalfa, and then crested wheatgrass. Uh, our biggest, our most common native plant was inland saltgrass. That was kind of hang out in our saline lowland ecological site. Uh, and then western wheatgrass was all the way here at the end, kind of hanging out at like about 2% for the landscape. That should have been like a lot higher if we were just looking at the ecological site description part of it. Um, so how does it look for structure? Well, it, we got pretty much exactly the structure gradient. A lot of our stuff we're interested in is the time since fire gradient. How do these patches on the landscape that we had in the map, how do they look different from each other? How do they look compared to when, before this pasture was burned? So any of my slides that have a not yet burned, that's kind of the thing as we progressed through this cycle, uh, that was the area that had previously had not be, not yet been burned, but had received kind of continuous grazing pressure prior to before we implemented patch burn grazing. So for every structure variable we measured, time since fire was the significant predictor variable. For none of these structural variables we measured, grazer type was important. So structurally, uh, the sheep version of patch burn grazing and cow calf patch burn grazing were identical from a structure standpoint, from just like how are the arrangement and kind of it. Uh, abstracted from plant community composition. Um, they, they, they were pretty identical for that. Uh, so for vor, for uh, max life height and max dead height and li, 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 litter depth, we all had recently burn patches being lower. And then as we uh, progressed through time, our three years since fire, so the stuff we burned prior to the 2017 grazing season, by the time we finished our first burn cycle, that was greater than it had ever been previously on the pasture. So we had increased the overall kind of range of structure on the landscape than, 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 than when, 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 when we first started. Um, out of all the stuff that I did measure, but the only time that the only time that grazer type did become important for the stuff I measured was for functional group responses. I'm not going to talk too much about the plant community composition uh, data because we didn't see a lot there, kind of in ordination space. But we did have, have at the broader level a forb and legume difference between sheep and cattle pastures, where we had low, low, lower forb cover in the sheep pastures. Uh, if you think about that for just a second, uh, sheep and goats would have a higher preference for, for kind of non-grass material than cows do, and then we, we did see that over time. Uh, on these landscapes. That has a much more direct impact for pollinator communities. Uh, one of my other uh, grad students I work with, Jasmine Cutter, uh, she has some papers out looking at the bee and butterfly pastures, the bee and butterfly communities on these pastures, and they have a little, a little lower abundance and diversity in these sheep pastures, mostly just as a trickle-down effect of having fewer fo forward resources available or fewer flower resources available on these pastures. 
Uh, okay, for the, so the veg structure, we're able to create and increase structural contrast. Uh, no main structural differences between the sheep and cattle, um, from like, for, for at least for the, the bird side of it. Um, and to get to the forage side of it, uh, kind of like what is in it for the livestock to help create this increased structural heterogeneity. Uh, we measured f f kind of forage quality and f f uh, the f spatial distribution of uh, the grazing livestock at the same point uh, the, through, through, through fecal pads. So I clipped a, a forage sample and I counted the fecal pads in an area as a count of space use. And uh, we used the NIRS to get protein and fiber uh, for uh, e each forage sample that we did. Um, our kind of main takeaway, uh, for is, is we had a similar effect where time since fire was the best predictor variable uh, for, for all of our forage sample, for all of our forage variables that we did. Uh, kind of what you'd expect uh, did happen. We had the, the lowest available biomass in the recently burned patches sustained over uh, the grazing season. It's kind of hard, it's really hard to read on, it's clearer on this screen. Uh, but the, 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 the purple colors, the re, 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 recently burned patches, uh, so available biomass is this top one. We were expecting or we would hope to see that's lower than the others and it was. Uh, for, for, for available biomass, that's kind of another way of backing up the veg structure data that we did. You can either measure it with a verbell pole or biomass or plant height and it should hopefully all come out to the same answer and it did, so that was good to see. Uh, forage moisture content, you don't usually see that reported. Uh, when I did like the ordination for that, that was like, kind of our best predictor variable for grazer space use, was kind of how fresh was the forage. So they might go to an area that, that hadn't uh, been burned in a while if they found a pocket that was fresh, and they would go graze that, and that's kind of our best way of looking at that. But then the f forage crude protein content, uh, if you've ever looked at a forage protein graph, they usually kind of have this quick fall off. So we have a, a we did have a higher peak uh, forage crude protein earlier in the season that went, the recently burn patches were higher in that. Uh, a lot of the first, maybe the first half of burns that we did at Hedinger, we did them in the fall. And so uh, the uh, faculty got mad at me for complaining that we weren't getting as big of protein spikes as I wanted. And so we switched to doing some spring burns for the last two years. And then um, if we were to split this protein graph out, uh, you would see a lot more drastic for the spring burns. We had about 16 to 18% for most of the summer for when we had those spring fires. Uh, for, for fiber, that's another one that's not really reported as much, but since we had the cool NRS machine, we could get more data. But fiber, um, if you look at some other, other uh, background work, uh, they said like the, the fiber differences after a fire can last a lot longer than protein differences. Um, for, for ours, what NDF and ADF uh, were, were lowest in recently burned patches. Uh, and the, both those fiber things, they kind of, as those go up, they kind of, you have a, a, a decrease in palatability and uh, digestibility for most of your forage. Uh, for, 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 for lignin, that, the one also helps control digestibility of forage. Uh, we didn't have as, as big of a difference between uh, the recently burned patches and other, other where, but the, the recently burned patches were still lower in, in, in for, 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 for forage lignin content. Uh, I, I'm sorry for spe speeding through, through, through these. I can, uh, but kind of what, what does that mean kind of at the end of it? For space use, uh, kind of as you would hope for elsewhere in the Great Plains uh, did happen here where per, both grazer, uh, the sheep and cattle both preferred recently burned patches. Uh, so kind of this the selection index was a way of standardizing uh, the uh, kind of, if you have a sheep, uh, sheep produce more fecal pats in an area than a cow did, so we needed a way to help standardize uh, between the two grazer types. Uh, so a one kind of mean they're using that area in, in, in proportion with the amount it is on the landscape, anything above that is kind of a, a preference for it. Uh, the closer you get to zero, the, 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 the few, few, fewer fecal pats are in the area, the fewer animals are spending time in the area. So for our most time since fire, this is green or weird, whatever color this is on the projector now. Uh, that, that is a, that, that's as, about as close to zero as we ever got. And that's that most time since fire this area we would hope is being avoided. Sheep and cattle are both not using that zone over the course of the season. Uh, kind of the only difference we had here is that cattle are using the intermediate. So that's our one to two and two to three years since fire. They're using that a little bit more than, than the sheep are later in the season. Uh, but kind of a, across the board, they had a higher preference for recently burned patches over the four years that we did that. Um, and for what does that mean for livestock weight gains? Uh, this is kind of the kind of ch chasing the dragon of sustainable livestock production. Uh, kind of the in what ranchers would tell you in there, oh, I went to have consistent weight gains. Uh, but then normally when you're doing a rotational system or a continuous grazing, your livestock weight gains are directly like very tightly tied to precipitation. Uh, we did not really see that at all. Um, kind of our biggest uh, difference that we had, we had a diversion weight gain in 2018. That was our normal rainfall year. Some of that. For the cow and calf, we had this big split from our average line. Uh, some of that is due to herd turnover. Uh, we had like eight cows of our 68 
uh, that were over 2,000 pounds in our 2017 drought, and those were our only eight cows that lost weight over the course of the study, and that was that one summer they did. Uh, those went on to greener pastures, and we got some a lot younger heifers uh, in for that. Uh, we had eight new younger heifers in 2018. I don't think that it explains all of that divergent uh, weight gain we had there, uh, but for the rest of the study, we had very consistent weight gains. Uh, the 2016 to this left, that was the year before we had uh, patch burn grazing, so it was a mostly normal rainfall year without fire um, that we had there. Okay, on uh, to the, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to the soils here so we don't run too far past our time. Uh, and that way if people have any questions. Um, but for the soil side of it, uh, when we talking to people, like, oh, well, what does that do for soil health? Uh, does creating above ground heterogeneity, does that come at the expense of below ground soil nutrients and microbes? Um, when I took a class, I was getting very interested in that. And like my initial expectation was that I was going to be talking about, okay, if we do have a dip down in our nutrient pools or microbes for that first year, does that come back? I was expecting that was the story I was going to be writing for the intensity gradient. It was going to be following it like that. Uh, we'll get to see some cool stuff here in a second. But we measured it kind of the same spatial scale. We measured everything else, patches of each pasture and looking at an ecological site. Uh, we looked at, um, we used a PLFA, phospholipid fatty acid analysis for our microbial. Uh, to, to look at the soil microbial abundance. Uh, we also did some stuff with litter bags to look at a decomposition activity. Um, I can spend a lot of uh, time going through all of what we've measured and showing you all of that in about 10 more graphs. However, uh, for every nutrient that we measured, uh, there was no negative effect with time since fire gradient. So in, in no instance was the recently burned patch lower than the unburned patch or the patch with the most time since fire. So uh, ammonium, nitrate, soil moisture, uh, calcium, total carbon, phosphorus, and what else I have on magnesium. Uh, it was all either identical or higher. Um, so I thought that was very cool. Um, and then for, for soil microbial abundance, it was the same thing. So we measured uh, ammonium and nitrate. We did that every month that we did forage samples. We did uh, ammonium and nitrate and soil moisture during that time. Uh, some of these other ones we did just one time during the summer. Uh, so as kind of being a grad student, we have a, a little bit limited budget to do all of the cool things we would like to do. I'd like to have measured some of these more uh, than that. But uh, none of them came back with the, the recently burned patch being lower than anything, the other, the most time since fire or the unburned patch that we did. Uh, so it's kind of a weird thing, like, it's one of the rare like, no effect is a good thing. Uh, so if you have, there was, you just recently, you burn this area, cows or sheep grazed the hell out of it for a summer, and it just did not matter. The sheep, the, the, the microbes were fine, the nutrients were fine. Um, and soil moisture was fine. Uh, so who is in the microbial community? It's pretty much all bacteria. Or they make up the biggest proportion of most of these uh, rangeland soils. Uh, kind of across North Dakota from one of my other uh, uh, committee members, Kaylee Gash, a lot of her other stuff did the same thing of like, it's mostly bacteria in these rangeland soils. Uh, soil fungi, I was expecting them to like take the biggest hit uh, with fire because they're a little more sensitive. And so they just kind of increase in the most time since fire. Um, like my biggest explanation for that is if you have more litter uh, accumulated in those areas, the fungi are a little better able to use that material. Um, but also our community composition did not really change very much. Uh, and then I have, uh, I'm going to use a little bit of my uh, time here to talk about the study that we did uh, with uh, just like five miles down the road, uh, where we did a little bit more intensive soil sampling on the microbes and the nutrients. Uh, this is one that just came out in Geoderma. So we studied these uh, soils the day before the fire, we measured them, day after the fire. Uh, uh, seven days and then seven months. So I ran out, took soil samples, same spot. We had a uh, area that was unburned, area that was burned, and we did the same soil sampling. We look at nutrients and microbes on that. Uh, what we saw was like for um, for, for nitrogen, uh, we might have a slight dip up to uh, like maybe at seven days after the fire, but after seven months, it was higher for ammonium and nitrate. And then for the the, the uh, for the back microbial community, there it was about the same thing. We have a one day dip. And soil microbes, by seven days, they were right back to the level they were beforehand, if not a little bit higher. Um, and then for why the reasoning is for like in these rangeland soils that we have there, uh, the soil heating does not go past very much past two centimeters. So if a grassland fire is moving relatively quickly. Uh, so if you, from a soil perspective, there's like it's not getting very hot very far down in the soil. So you might uh, at worst kill the microbes in that first centimeter of soil, and then they're very they can respond very quickly and they're back. Uh, to the level they were just before then. Um, so that was one of the, I was expecting going into the soil part of this, hey, it's going to have a big dip and we're going to slowly build it back up over time. So hopefully by the time we get to two years since fire or three years since fire, is it equal to what it was beforehand? Instead, the microbes are like, I don't really care. That's fine. Do what you want to do. Um, 
So for kind of our conclusions, kind of what we're interested in, like we did kind of increase our structural heterogeneity despite our kind of low diversity plant community. Uh, we did have the, the grazer preference that we were looking for. Uh, and these soil microbes and nutrients were very resistant uh, to patch burn grazing. Uh, it's it's kind of how we did all of our fires. So like the uh, talk there today, like who uses uh, mode breaks versus disc breaks. All of our stuff on the on the heading or extension center, we did uh, disc breaks to make the, the director happy. He was worried about us burning the town down that's like a mile and a half north of us. Uh, and then, but all of our stuff we did kind of off station. We did was was mode uh, breaks for that. And I think I have a little bit of time uh, for a question or two. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so for, for adding in like different classes or types of livestock, those one of the things I was happy when the Prairie Project thing got going. Like I was, uh, like goat is like a dirty word in North Dakota, but it's like we have these little snowberry shrubs and like they're trying to make cows eat it and that's not gonna happen. Uh, so you just put a goat there and like you can't say that. It's like, okay, well. Uh, so, but it was like, yeah, so if they're gonna eat slightly different things than the cows do. So if you can balance your animal units out, uh, it, it'll, you'll more, if you're trying to uh, increase forage utilization across the landscape. That's a great way to do that, is to change up your classes of livestock that you have. Um, if you are interested in, uh, so we were, we had the lower forb and legume cover in our pastures. We were, we were hoping that we weren't, we were gonna like uh, convince the sheep to not go into other patches to strip alfalfa down, to take all the flowers away. We weren't successful in doing that. So like, they're still gonna go find flowers. So if you're interested in like a pollinator community, you might be a little more like hands-on with directing where sheep and goats can go. Um, where I went this summer, it was like in Idaho with some like a lot more diverse for forbs. I'd be interested in like doing any of this fire and grazing stuff where they have a more diverse forb community to see if we can like still keep forbs in other parts of the pasture. But yeah, like they're, they're gonna use it a little bit different of the forage resources. Yep. Mm -hmm. The Jasmine Cutter. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Extension Center, they primarily did like duck and pheasant research is like what's their biggest, so like we did not do, they not do as intensive of like grassland bird sampling. My friends at the Streeter Grassland Extension Center, they did a lot more like people out with rope dragging looking for birds and they have some papers on that. Um, the stuff at Hedinger was mostly geared towards uh, pheasants and ducks. Um, I, I think they're in the process of working through the data on that. They did some point count data. I have not heard from them in a year, so I don't know what they're up to. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did see a lot of more horn larks in the burn patches, which is what, like they, they like the lower vegetation. But yeah. So if you were going to design the perfect patch burn grazing system for that part of North Dakota, what would your fire return number be? Uh, so I would probably go with like a more like adaptive thing, where sometimes I might not burn. So like we had a 2020 drought going into 2021, and then uh, Ben. Uh, Gomont, he's the director there. He was like, it looks rough. I was like, well, if it's, you already have two patches that are like, look like they've been recently burned. Like, I, it's not great from a science perspective to like not have a fire, but from a management side, you've already got your short vegetation. It's like, I would probably like build in a little more adaptiveness to, or even like a, maybe like a five or a six. So that way you have a little, few more patches uh, available. Cause we were burning uh, rough, like a 160 acre pasture. We were burning like 40 acres at a time. Um, so like at the Streeter one, we did add like a, we split it. We had some uh, of the treatments that were like a split. We had essentially eight patches. We did a spring fire and a summer or like a fall for that. Yes, like that's one of the things uh, my friend uh, Jasmine and Ben that they were trying to do uh, we did not see very many of the stuff they were overseeding in the, so like they were overseeding in the winter just before the snow would melt. Uh, but then some of it, uh, they hadn't quite solved that part because like with the bluegrass and the other ones, like they just seem to have like a stranglehold on things coming in. And so it, it's been very hard. So we're, our hope was that over time we can punch a hole in those introduced cool season grasses and allow some space. And like we have a tiny little bit coming through, but not a lot yet. All right, cool. Thanks.